Dev Basu, so he's CEO and founder here, a uh, self-proclaimed polymath. He wears many hats, and for those of you from Seneca, he's actually uh, been a teacher there in the past, so you can grill him shamelessly. Uh, but he is uh, you know, the founder of Powered by Search, and he's also an author and a speaker, um, and he has 10 plus years in the business working with some of the biggest brands, so I'm um, really excited to be hearing from him tonight. I'm both... Um I'm excited and challenged to tell you the story about Powered by Search and how we've we built it. Um, excited because it's the first actually chance that I've had to tell it publicly. Folks in the team um, know, especially for those who have been around for uh, you know long enough, a couple of years basically. But it started off in 2009, and I'm challenged, I guess, because it's hard to try and compress you know six years of learnings and trials and triumphs basically into the next 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, but I, I'll try my best basically to tell you the story of entrepreneurship. Oh wait, did I say shit? I meant entrepreneurship. Okay. Um, all right. So. My talk is called Persistence versus Perseverance. So does anybody know the difference between the two? Quick show of hands if you say I. Okay, so persistence is a skill, right? That's when you're just dogged, basically. Um, perseverance is about grit. It's about being able to, it's a virtue. It's being able to not only power through the, the, the dark times, the bad times, the stuff when, when it feels like nothing's working, basically. And you need both of them in order to, to succeed as an entrepreneur. And hopefully some of the lessons from Powered by Search uh, and building it, basically, will be applicable to well, each one of you. So a quick show of hands over here. Say I if you've worked at a startup or you, ha you, uh, you want to work at a startup. OK, great. Fantastic. So let's get started. All right, so a little bit about me before uh, I can talk, you know, getting into the story about Powered by Search. So I started in the marketing industry in 2005. I was in university in first year, actually, at that point in time. And uh, at that point, I was a traditional marketer. I didn't know anything about digital. And I happened to get a, an opportunity to work at Microsoft as a marketing associate. And one of the, the funniest stories basically ended up happening over there. I was assigned the, the uh, responsibility of taking care of Microsoft.ca at that point in time. Now, there was no Bing, so MSN.ca, for those of you who can remember, was the main search engine that, that Microsoft had. It's always played second fiddle to Google. In fact, we were encouraged never to use Google while working at Microsoft. If you had an iPhone, which came out in 2007 afterwards, there was actually a little bin, basically, where you, you could throw in an iPhone, and it'd give you two Windows phones at that point in time. So a bit of a conundrum basically happened. Um, I used to work with accounts like Dell, Lenovo, MDG, and so on. And uh, I was in the process of basically giving them marketing promotions that they could use to sell more Windows, uh, Office, and server products every single month. Now, the, the actual code changed all the time. Now, has anybody over here used SharePoint before? Microsoft SharePoint? Yeah. So it's a terrible product, OK? <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible product as an internet product. And we used SharePoint to build websites, which is totally not what it's meant for. And these URLs that I used to send over every single month, 300 to 400 emails a month, used to change all the damn time. And so eventually, I just started getting really frustrated by the same people asking me the same question month after month after month. And I said, hey, can you just search it? And so I, they went on MSN.ca, they searched up, and I, I was working on a team called the OEM team. That's, that stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. And um, basically, they said, I did search a dev, but I, never, I didn't find it. So, and this kept happening again and again and again. And eventually, what I told them was what I shouldn't have. I said, did you use Google? And they said, yeah, I did. So I went over to a VP of mine, and I said, hey, there's a big conundrum over here. We seem to have a company uh, that owns a search engine that can't find a product on our own website. This is, seems to be a problem. And so she said, yeah, that is, that is a problem, Dev. Can you help solve this problem? And I said, I know nothing about this, but sure, I'll give it a shot. And uh, she said, here's $50,000. Go fix it. So I went to our creative agency at that point in time, and I, not knowing what a digital marketing agency was, of course. And I said, all right, guys, we have this problem. Can you fix it? They said, yes, of course we can fix it. So we gave them the $50,000. A month went by. They said it's fixed. It wasn't. 
right? So when I, when I left Microsoft at that point in time, um, I knew that this was a big need. If one of the, you know, the Fortune sort of 100 companies at that point in time couldn't even find stuff using a search engine that it built on a site that it owns, um, this problem of being able to get visible on a search engine was something that was clearly affecting other people and brands as well. And that's where I started getting the inklings, basically, of starting a business around that particular concept. That's a little bit about me. All right, so here's what I thought my actual path would be. Okay, so this is your typical Silicon Valley hierarchy of needs. Then, Does anybody here watch the show Silicon Valley from HBO? Yes, okay. So I thought that you know I'd get my branded t-shirt and eventually work at some large company basically, really repping it. So I'd be, I'd be like one of those Apple guys you see at the Apple store with the red shirt and the, the Apple logo, for example. I'd get some free food at work, and I did actually rampage Microsoft when I worked there. Um, I, when I was 16, I looked nothing like I do right now. I had four chocolate milks a day, okay? Eventually, I got fat as a result of that, okay? Uh, and then I lost a bunch of weight afterwards as well, but the chocolate milks didn't do me any favors. <laughs> then I went on a bit of a sabbatical after that, and I, for six months, I didn't work anywhere. Um, I started a blog. It was called uh, Daily Moolah, believe it or not. And it was about the make money online niche. And I became an affiliate marketer. So that was the way I learned more about search engine optimization and paid search marketing. I made a killing, actually, in affiliate marketing. But I felt that something was missing over there. It didn't feel like I had a purpose. It didn't feel like I was doing anything that was you know, really changing the world. I wasn't helping anybody. I was just kind of making money at that point in time. And I, I, I didn't feel very fulfilled. Um, Medium didn't exist, so I quit that, and, and then I got contacted by somebody else, an agency in the city, to come work for them. So I did. I went over, and it was a, it was a lucrative opportunity. I uh, was being paid a full-time income, working part-time while going to school. And that happened again and again. So now I'm on my third job, and basically the Yellow Pages group, um, an affiliate of theirs, had asked me to come build an agency for them. It was an incredible opportunity. I was 18 or 19 years old at that point in time. They asked me, they gave me a very, very um, you know, lucrative offer that I could not turn down. And basically, I was working four days a week. I was you know, basically putting my courses on a Monday and a Friday and taking virtual courses while attending school full time at that point in time. I wrote about some of these experiences on my, on my site, but medium.com did not exist at that point in time. It does right now, and you can go read some of my, my, my existential crisis blog posts on there. Uh, some of them are really quite popular, and I wrote one uh, about two years ago called 26 Things I Learned When I Turned 26. Uh, it got really popular. I didn't have any coverage, basically, or any friends on Medium at that point in time. But it's one of those very democratic type of um, networks where if you put out good content, you really can get a lot of eyeballs, basically, a lot of, uh, of coverage, as well as a lot of uh, engagement. So that's what I thought my path would be. Now, most startups, they start in a garage. Mine didn't. Mine started off on, in the year 2009 in a 50 square foot solarium. And that was my view, basically. This was in Scarborough. And I started off. And essentially, I'll tell you the story of how Powered by Search started. Uh, it said that the world was built in seven days. Um, I built and incorporated my startup on the eighth day. The only way I know this was because it was a day of rest on Sunday, and, uh, and that's when I started my business, basically. So starting Monday, I was in business, and at that point in time, I've got, I had the domain, I had the website, um, built basically all of that over the span of three days. It was a long weekend. And on Monday, I was in business, and by Tuesday, I had my first client as well. So the first month billings was something like five or $6,000, basically. I've got a, a timeline to show you about what that looked like. So 2009, started the business. It was uh, essentially started from the bottom, one staff, i.e. me, uh, and uh, zero clients at that point in time. Uh, I started off in October. And as you know, if anybody sells professional services, you might know that December is not the best time to get a client. Okay? Yeah. So when people were essentially going through their Christmas vacations, I was quiet, I was building, I was Bob the Builder, basically, so that I wanted to start off January right. And we did, okay, so um, in 2010, um, I had three people by the end of the year. I had my first real employee, started off the company with a friend of mine, and we had about $400,000 in revenue at the end of the year. Sounds like a pretty good story at that point in time. And it just kept growing and growing from over there. So, you know, in 2011 and, 20, and 2012, uh, we have won a few awards. Uh, one of them was a, an entrepreneurship award called the Deloitte Impact Infuse Award. 
Uh, we won a uh, Profit Hot 50 award as well for um, Canada's fastest growing startups. And that's based on a two year growth span. We, won we basically grew about, I think it was 464% over a two year uh, time span. And at that point in time, we might have had maybe five employees. Um, fast forward to 2012, we won uh, an award for Branham 300, which is again a, a, a growth index basically of some fastest growing startups. Um, actually, I wouldn't say startups because you have the likes of Brim as well as Microsoft on there as well. So some of the largest companies in Canada are on that list. So that kind of kept going basically. And in 2014, at the start of 2014, um, something momentous basically happened, and the, the Powered by Search that you see today came into existence. So um, a, a few buddies in mine, um, Matt, for example, a friend of mine back in the room, uh, towards the back of the room over there, we'd been discussing some growth challenges we were having, and we decided to essentially merge companies together. So three companies came together, Powered by Search, Small Business Online Coach, and Net Connections uh, with a third partner of ours who's based out in Kelowna. Uh, his name's Warren Houston. So the three companies came together and it was chaos. It was a little bit like trying to figure out blended families because we each had different backgrounds. We came into the, the, the merger with our own employees. Suddenly we had a staff of like 55 people and it was a completely different game because each of our companies had roughly about 15 to 20 people at that point in time. And to put it all together and trying to figure that out meant that 2014 really was a transition year in many ways, just trying to find your footing in, in many ways. Um, but you know what? We ended up having a great year regardless. And uh, one of the things that I should have mentioned, by the way, in 2013 and 2014 was starting off with Inbound Marketing Toronto. So this is what, where we are today. It's amazing that it's three years later and it's basically going and we have a strong audience like you guys basically, many of who uh, basically come out multiple times. And um, I see some familiar faces in the room that have been there since the beginning. We also started a conference called Inbound Con. And Inbound Con grew to become Canada's biggest and fastest growing inbound marketing conference at a time when nobody else was really talking about inbound marketing in the, in the industry, certainly not agencies. So the only player that really was was this little known company called HubSpot back in the day. Okay. Uh, and this is before inbound marketing got popular as a term. And then fast forward to 2015 to now, basically, uh, we, we've continued keeping on growing. We've, we've hired some amazing people. We've started building out new teams, basically. And I wouldn't quite say that we are a startup as much as we'd like to think anymore. So you might consider us a late stage startup. Um, and my CFO, Warren, basically says we're kind of a stay up. Now, I, I'm not used to that term, so I'm like wobbling, going, OK, I think I found a little bit of my footing, basically. And then on to the future, basically. We don't know what that looks like, but I did write a blog post about it, because that's what marketers do. So the question, which is on everybody's mind, which is, you know, I've got an idea. How do I transform that into a reality, basically? Um, how do I take this thing that's really a you know, completely vague idea that I'd love to become a reality and bring it into something tangible that you can touch and feel and work with? Most of my ideas I get in the shower, okay? Powered by Search came to me in the shower as well. And so I went, how do I basically take this idea and become, uh, make it into a reality? To tell you that, I think I first need to tell you why we, why we do what we do, basically. So why do we exist? And uh, this is our mission. So we believe that the internet holds possibilities for people and their companies. So this is the fact, like if you ever just stop and smell the roses, the fact that we've got a digital camcorder over there recording this into a digital file of ones and zeros, or the fact that this presentation is on Google Slides um, up in the cloud being saved every single time that an edit's basically made, or the fact that we can use uh, you know, Skype or Wi-Fi or any of these things are all testament to the fact that we have access to the internet. If we didn't have access to the internet, none of these things would really be possible. And the internet as we know it and all the things we can do with it is changing all the time. It's growing. And there's an early adopter crowd, namely you guys, basically. You're on the cutting edge. You're always trying to figure out new ways of being able to do things. But there's a bell curve. And businesses and the people that work in them are being left behind. So they don't really know how to basically take access of all the things that the internet basically offers. So that was our founding belief. Our founding belief was that we see this possibility, this untapped potential basically, that the internet offers. It's got nothing to do with marketing. It's got nothing to do with search engines at all. It's just the internet at its very core and its ability to unify people. The second thing is that 
we do everything that we do helps businesses succeed. So whether that was pre-digital marketing, uh, when I you know used to work at Microsoft, or every company since that I've either worked for or with, um, or the people that I work with at Powered by Search, our core values really are helping businesses and the people that work within those businesses succeed. We do that through the internet. Now every step we take transforms um, you know the practice of confusion to clarity and we unlock the path to predictable growth because ultimately that's what all businesses really want. They want to be able to control their destiny and know what a better tomorrow basically looks like. Unfortunately, most companies and the people that work in them don't have this. Do you know how many leads you're going to get next month or how much traffic you'll get or how many engage I know how many engaged followers you'll get, how many likes? Most people don't know, and even when they do look back, they can't actually predict why what happened happened. They're not able to connect the dots between success and the activities that basically drove that. So we, we want to help with that particular process. We want to take that fog, essentially, that lack of clarity, and bring clarity in, in your marketing practices. So that's basically what Powered by Search does. Right. Concept of fear. I think a lot of us feel this, basically, whenever we're thinking about launching something. Public speaking, for example, is actually uh, more people fear public speaking than death, believe it or not. And so that's sort of one of the fears that I had to get over. I'll tell you a story about fear, uh, both when I started Powered by Search, but also about three days in. So the story of how I started. Um, most of the things that I've done in my life have come from a place of great discomfort. So when I'm pushed to the edge between a rock and a hard place, that is when I've taken the most massive action that I've ever taken in my life. In this case, uh, you could, um, and I've written about this on, online as well, my manager at the time basically told me three things. And uh, it was, uh, I was between a rock and a hard place at work, and uh, the manager basically told me, A, Dev, never launch a business. You don't know how hard it is. Dev, you have no idea how expensive fax machines are. And... <laughs> And number three, Dev, you're going to be a terrible manager. So hearing uh, you can't or you won't is ex extremely powerful and motivational. And that's one of the reasons where I said, what the heck? How bad can it really be? Let me take a shot at this and see what I can make of it. In six months' time, if it doesn't end up working out, that's not going to be the end of the world. And Mark Twain basically has got a quote around this. And he says, I've known a great many troubles in my life, most of which have never happened. And that's probably true for most of you as well, right? If you think about times when you are fearful or, or you're anxious, anxiety is just failure in advance. So try not to be that way. Think about taking massive action. And most of us, we have great ideas, but we don't have great execution. And the reason why we don't move forward with these ideas and they just remain at that conceptual stage is because you don't take action. Tony Robbins has been known to say that all change happens in an instant, basically. And, and if you think about it, any change you had in your life at all, any particular change, no matter how small or big, happened in an instant. It only took you enough time to work yourself up to that change to make that change happen. So that was the concept of fear that I had to come um, over because I was walking away from a very lucrative six-figure job at that point in time into the abyss of the unknown and starting a professional services business. So I wasn't particularly special. There were a lot of other companies that, pro that claimed to do search engine optimization and digital marketing. And trying to make a name for yourself in, uh, in those initial days is really, really hard. But it's something that every single startup has to contend with. So what did I do? Um, I started thinking about Blue Ocean Strategy. Now, uh, raise your hand if you've read the book. OK. Um, Blue Ocean Strategy has to do with a, a framework for thinking, basically. And that is, instead of trying to compete in a hotly contested market, in the same way that your competitors are competing, why not go a different path? Take the, the road less traveled. So here's some things that I assured myself right in the beginning. I wouldn't work on an hourly basis, okay? So that I would look at the value of what we brought to the table rather than trading hours for dollars. And that's something that Powered by still does, Powered by Search still does to this day. We do not work on an hourly basis because the value we drive has nothing to do with the number of hours that we basically work. The second thing that we started looking at and in, um, in being able to do Blue Ocean Strategy was we would not compete on price. We only wanted to work with clients who wanted to work with the best. 
And so strongly believed in being able to be the top 5% basically at whatever we did in each individual discipline that we followed. Um, and the third one was try to be interesting and different and useful, most importantly. So every other website basically that, that um, advertise some of the services that we offer, whether that's digital marketing or content strategy or search engine optimization or paid search, they were exclusively focused on delivering packages as if clients are a one-size-fits-all type of strategy, where it would be a, a gold, a bronze, or a silver, or a platinum package. And I hated that because I'd been agency side and I, I, I'd seen how other agencies work. And a lot of the times, there was actually very little value that was being delivered in return for those packages. So every client is unique. Their circumstances are unique. Their goals are unique. So why should their solutions be cookie cutter? As so we followed that, basically, and that seemed to work for us. I'm going to show you two things that I did differently um, along with a team. The first one was inbound TO. Wasn't my idea, actually. So by hiring people that were smarter than I was, that had more time to think about interesting and unique problems and challenges, we had uh, our marketing team basically come up with the idea for inbound TO. I was one of those people that always believed that digital was a way of connecting with people. And we did a great job at it. You know, we had marketing automation before most other agencies basically did. Uh, we were thinking about uh, remarketing and paid search or, or advanced SEO strategies before others did. But uh, this teammate, for example, brought about a completely different perspective in me and said, Dev, let's get out of the building and let's start bringing a, building a community around our brand. And that was the genesis of Inbound TO. And all it had to do, from uh, all, I, all I had to do on my part as CEO was say, hey, why not? Let's try it. Again, the same belief. If it doesn't work out, what's the worst that could happen? And it was a runaway success. We had about 60 people show up at the first one. Um, and ever since then, basically, now we're on number 33. Three years later, it's still going strong. Um, a lot of people have come up to me after an inbound TO and said, why do you guys do this? Why do you take the time to basically organize these events? Do you do it to acquire clients, for example? Is it about getting connections? And um, our response and my response has always been the same. It's for none of those things. It's for building, it's for the sake of building a community and for building good karma. It's about giving back. And the interesting thing about the world and the way it works is when you give more than you take, you actually get a lot back. So that's always been a philosophy for us. And it's interesting how you, when you play the long game, success kind of begets success. In fact, we have sales conversations where a prospect will approach us and say, I saw you guys speak or do something four years ago. And uh, that kind of stuck with me. And so now we're looking for a digital marketing agency to work with, and I'd love to work with you guys. So it's never trying to play that short game. To, uh, it's not, we don't think in campaigns, for example, right? What can we do to extract the maximum amount of value with whatever we're investing in? And that's why we started Inbound TO. So a year later, we said, why not take that a step further? And uh, instead of just doing that on a per month basis and attracting you know, somewhere between 30 and 70 people at these marketing meetups, let's try doing that on a bigger scale. And so that's always been a core tenant as well, which is like, Think bigger, basically. You know, whenever you think that you've, you've done enough, it's not enough. You can 10x that, basically. You can always think bigger. And if you aren't thinking bigger, somebody else is. So we thought, why not that, let that be us? So we created InboundCon. This is a video from last year that I'll play. Oh, can you try it? Thanks. This, this, is, this is a conference for marketers that are, that are in the trenches doing the work day in, day out. And it's very, very insightful. Every single talk is, is basically giving people things to walk away with they can grab on and start using right away. Yeah, that's positive. That's good, that's good. And I think the key thing that's separate. How many of you have heard of InboundCon before? Most people in this room. Have you, have you attended InboundCon? You totally should. You're missing out. <laughs> Because one of the things that we did this year that was really different um, in terms of 2015 inbound con was we started bringing together the best marketing speakers from all around North America. So we really flew down people from, um, from Mexico, from the United States basically, all around Canada as well. And the entire idea was let's architect this conference as a conversion funnel. 
and go from top of funnel, which is acquiring traffic and getting in front of the right audiences, um, all the way down to bottom of funnel and conversion rate optimization. So if you are a marketer, you're having a challenge at some stage, basically, of the buyer funnel, and that's what we helped uh, uh, essentially address with all of these fantastic speakers. So um, hopefully we'll be able to tell you a little bit about that as soon as these, these um, uh, speakers are hooked up. It's a great conference from a good one. It's about being able to be helpful and be valuable to each other and give each other something that can really act on. At the end of the day, it's did you learn anything? And so even for me, I'm learning things that I didn't know about that I, ha I haven't been able to learn any other conference. You know what, my big aha moment has been not reinventing the wheel. Because there's so much out there that you could potentially do in terms of initiatives or strategies, but it's, it's important to do less but better. It's really important to own what you do and be very, very good at it. Stay up ahead of, you know, everything that is coming up so far and the web is moving so fast. So definitely InboundCon is a place to go and come. If you come to InboundCon, the next day you will have things that you can actually do with the information that you learned the day before. Everything is actionable, so you can go home and, and use these things. And I think the, the ch most challenging thing for a participant is going to be figuring out, um, you know, which thing to do first. I'll, I'll definitely be back for InboundCon next year. It, it, this is, it, it's uh, growing in, in stature and the, the quality of the, the content's been fantastic. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm excited that always end with a call to action. <laughs> so we are planning our next inbound con. It's going to be happening at the CBC Glen Gold Theatre. Uh, Caitlin is again an I event organizer for that and her and editor are working extremely hard to make it a successful event. It's going to be bigger and better than ever before. So hopefully we'll see uh, most of you over there this year. Okay, so next step. Outcare your competition. Now, if you want to tweet this, you can't scale giving a shit, okay? And that's really, really important because you can deliver a good service, you can deliver a good product, for example, but ultimately what people care about uh, when you're working with them is do you have their best interests at heart? And so one of the things that we really um, try to get in, in the people that we hire at Powered by Search is are they curious? Do they care? So when they're actually delivering a solution, they're actually asking the client, hey, that thing that we did, how'd that work out for you, for example? Um, is there anything that else that we could do to make that better for you? And, and that curiosity is something that I don't really see very often in, um, in the other types of, of agencies or consultants that our clients have previously worked with. Generally speaking, we're not somebody's first boyfriend or girlfriend, which means that these, the clients that we work with have been around the block. They've worked with other companies, and the most frequent thing that we hear from them is that they didn't provide us enough strategy, and they didn't seem to care enough or get my business. And if, you know, everybody likes to feel like they're unique and special, and that was a key way that we went above and beyond the call of duty. So by being able to kind of 10x what we did, um, that, that was a big deal. Now I want to talk a little bit about value, basically. Um, each one of us in the products that we create or the services that we deliver, there is a value exchange that happens over there. The most common as aspect of value is transactional value. I do this for you, you know, you give me money, okay? It's very, very transactional. You cut my hair, I give you money. Okay, fantastic. But there's something else, there's perceived value. So if I walk away having a fantastic experience and I feel great about myself after a haircut, that is a huge perceived value. And so in whatever you do, if you're at a startup or you hope to, to basically start your own company at some point in time, focus on giving more value than you receive. And if you can do that on every single interaction that you have, even when you don't win, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get the sale. It doesn't mean that your client's going to stick around forever. But just do it anyways. If you do it anyways, you're going to start finding that that good karma has a way of coming back to you, basically. So we tried to always outcare the competition. Even if we couldn't outdeliver them, we couldn't outprice them, for example, outcaring always helped us win. So uh, here's an example of how you can outcare even when you're not necessarily doing it for your client. So this is your typical web funnel, right? So you got your web visitors, you turn them into leads, and you spam the fuck out of them, basically, and then you got some customers that you love squeezed out towards the end of the funnel. So why do you have to get customers from the asshole of the funnel? It doesn't make any sense, right? You could do this instead. 
You could love your customers, and then they have some friends that they tell you know your about they, they tell about you, and then those friends want some of your love basically as well. And that's okay. Some people try you out, and some people don't basically. That's absolutely fine because that's a hallmark of a business that's got scale, that has that is lovable as a brand. And this aligns very well with what inbound marketing is basically all about. So when you delight people with the work that you do, with the vibes that you basically send out, they return that love back to you in a way where you, know, you could never imagine you couldn't architect or engineer basically in any way. Um, interesting enough, I did not draw this. I am a very poor artist. This is from Ben Chestnut. Do you know who Ben Chestnut is? Anybody? Have you heard of MailChimp? Okay, this is from MailChimp CEO. MailChimp is an ex extremely you know, popular, successful email marketing platform that's now morphed into basically a marketing automation platform in many ways, a lightweight marketing automation platform. But he put this up on, uh, on his blog and he called it Ditch the Funnel, basically, right? Um, and so as marketers, we're always thinking about funnels and trying to squeeze the most we can out of them, basically. But if you try doing what's on the, uh, the, the right-hand side, basically, like that, you're going to start seeing a lot more success. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be analytics-focused, obviously. We, we certainly are. We're very, very data-driven. I got a call today, actually, from um, a mobile app development agency who said, hey, I need to talk to you. I said, OK, well, what do you want to talk to me about? And they said, well, you see, if you search the term ad agencies on Google, you guys have written a blog post, and uh, we seem to be getting a ton of traffic from that. I'm going, OK, so you want me to send you an invoice or something? What's this call about, right? And they go, well, you, you've listed these 100 marketing agencies on this blog post, and we happen to be in the, at the bottom, and we want to know how we can make our ranking a little bit better. And I said, well, why do you care about that? And they said, well, you happen to be a top 10 referrer of traffic to our entire website. And we went, wow, OK, that's kind of interesting, because guess when this blog post was written? 2013. So it's three years later, <laughs> and, uh, and they want to find out how to make that blog post better. So we are going to make it better. And we're actually working on a concept and an idea right now where we're going to break it up um, outside the shell of basically what a blog post can, uh, can accomplish so we can actually drive more business to other agencies in the city, even if there are competition. Because we're not the best fit for everybody, and sometimes clients are not the best fit for us. But hey, you know what? Help other people, and hopefully they'll remember that, and you'll get another phone call like the one that I got today, and they'll say, hey, um, so I've got a piece of business for you that we don't necessarily work on. You're the first person that I thought about. That's the sign that you're succeeding, basically, in whatever else you're doing. OK. So focus. I talked about this at InboundCon, and I used the, the uh, Santuka knife over there because uh, you know the word decision? You know where it comes from? It's de-incision, OK? And it comes from the Latin to cut away. So when you're making a decision, you're not just deciding on what to do. You're deciding on what to cut away. And that was really, really important for us. And you know what? I'm not talking to you today about how we've done content marketing or how we did social, for example. I'm not talking about the tactical stuff, although I'm happy to answer questions about that afterwards. But I want to talk to you about how to decide what you, sh what you should be continuing to do what you should be cutting, for example, and what you should be absolutely axing. So here's an example of um, how you can get rid of some ineffective initiatives. Um, I use this uh, quadrant that I created just on a whiteboard, basically. So things that are proven and, and effective versus unproven and ineffective. So what we noticed was that webinars were really working well for us. Remarketing was working well for us. You know, uh, Referrals, for example, which everybody loves and enjoys, they're proven to work. And they're very effective, but you can't predict them that well. So that's why they didn't score that high, basically, on my chart. And I was then looking at you know, what is effective but unproven. So if you've heard about a concept called 10x content, basically, that's really been a buzzword over the last year or so, it's creating content that's truly exceptional. It's, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, design and development, research, et cetera, to create. But it's, it's probably effective, but it's unproven. So you want to start looking at that. And then we tried a bunch of other strategies. We always have a testing budget or a bank of ideas, basically, that we can go after. Often people come up and say, let's do this zany idea. And we'll say, yeah, let's try it. There's no harm in saying yes to trying something as long as the amount of investment in it is not something that's you know, huge, basically. You always have to try something because you'll never know when you'll, you'll hit gold, basically. So we tried something like StumbleUpon ads to get more traffic to our site. 
totally didn't work. And that's okay. You can learn a lot from failure as well. So part of our values basically is, uh, our values are very comparative. Um, so we say we like winning over losing, duh, right? But the second value that comes after that is learning over losing. So when you lose, don't lose the lesson. And so what we learn from that is stumble upon ads don't work, and we like to eat our own dog food, so we try that on ourselves before recommending it to a client. A lot of the other agencies that I know try stuff out on their clients as a hamster, okay, uh, on the hamster wheel basically. And then you go, oops, shouldn't have done that. But that was fun anyways because it's on somebody else's dime, right? So we try doing that for ourselves first. So now this leads us down to success, right? So we're getting into like 2014, 15-ish time frame, and you're going, sounds like a successful agency. No, it's a shit show, okay? Don't ever like, buy into somebody else's external appeal or sheen. And this is something that's really important because what every founder will never tell you, unless it's on a Medium blog post, is that there are times when they get depressed, when they, times when they, they don't, you know, like they, they pretend like them and their partners are like this, but really they're like that, okay? And it happens. It'll happen to you. It'll happen to people you know, for example. So what you feel is success or what you see as success may not really truly be the case, okay? So how do you actually get to success? First of all, you have to get a definition of whatever success means to you. An example of what I believe is, I don't believe in fundraising. We're completely bootstrapped. And I think that we, our customer success will drive our growth. We'll make our own investments. We invested in this office. It costs a bunch of money. But it was the right thing to do for us for the next stage of our growth. And we didn't want to take any investment money, even though we had private equity um, uh, companies basically saying, hey, can I buy out a chunk of your company, basically, and give you a whack of money? But that means inviting a new master, basically, into the room, right? And then you have to, we have to wonder whether that's the right thing to do. Um, obviously, there are, is a whole different camp of thinking where it's like raise, 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 raise as much money as you possibly can, and who, who cares if you're not cash flow positive, right? As long as the good times are coming, let's keep on rolling, basically. That's not us, so you have to think about what success basically means to you. Now, one of the roadblocks that we really ran into as we kept growing was how do we get better people, because we already had a really high standard. Everybody who works here is a rock star. So how do we get more rock stars? We're running out of rock stars, and we're going, man, like, how do we get the next generation of talent? And how do we get these teams that we have to work better together? Uh, one of the things that you should know is when a team starts getting beyond the size of seven people, basically, it starts degrading really quickly, because you start needing a, an actual management structure. And as a startup, Management structure is a, one, of those, one of those satanic type words where you're like, hierarchy? I don't want to think about that. I want to work in a completely flat environment. One of my biggest learnings um, that my partners and I had together collaboratively after we merged is that we needed the structure. We needed management structure. We could learn a lot from these otherwise bigger, more boring companies that would help us succeed and get to the next level. So we aggressively started empowering or uh, hiring people in 2014 and 2015 uh, to build that structure. We have a new structure of team leaders. We broke our operations into pods. We have a new account director group, for example. And all of that's been very instrumental in our success uh, to date. Now, now that you've had a bunch of these people, what do you do with them, right? So that's my, uh, my next tip, which is you've got to empower them. Uh, empowering them com really comes down to a couple of things. And I, I remember I said I was both excited and challenged because I could possibly talk to you for eight hours on stretch about how to motivate and lead people and all the things that I've learned, and I continue to learn every single day about that. But I can probably summarize it in uh, a, a few words. Lead, follow, or get the fuck out of the way, okay? So you don't want to be a micromanager, owner, or a founder, for example. You need to place trust in your people. And what I'm saying is, uh, is always very aspirational because I have that bug. I always get involved in stuff, even today, and it becomes that hub and spoke model. That's something that you really, really want to fight. And what the best way of doing that is to have a sounding board. Ask somebody to play that devil's advocate and be honest with you. If that's a co-founder, that's the person basically who says, hey man, you're doing it again. You know, you need to let your people just be who they are and trust them to do the jobs that you hired them to do. Um, and so that's basically the, the aspect of empowering. Okay, so five minutes. I probably won't take that long. Um, that's a, that concludes the portion around powered by search. Um, I don't know quite yet if we're a success story, but we are a work in progress. 
And I think that we do deliver more value than we take back from the community. And hopefully we'll continue doing that. And uh, we can only do that with the support of folks like yourself. What I'm showing you right now is a startup growth framework. So you'll see this on our website, right on our homepage. Now our clients typically come to us with uh, a set of very typical challenges. The challenges align with the points basically on this. So they either don't have enough traffic or they don't have enough engagement, meaning their traffic's not sticky. Uh, they have problems with conversion, so they might have all the traffic in the world, but conversions are really sucky. And then the last thing is they might be having great conversions and great traffic, but they don't have any advocates. So they have no idea how to build that brand ambassador program like Peace Collective, for example, has built. So they come to us and say, how do I make that basically happen, right? So these are some of the, 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 the path basically to growth in terms of that aligns well with both inbound marketing, but it aligns very well with the framework that we deploy for both ourselves as well as for all of our clients. What I'm about to show you next is a case study of a client called Touch Bistro. And uh, they are a uh, iPad point of sale startup. So they're a startup that's a hardware and a software play. Essentially, you'll start seeing them in independent coffee shops just down the street. If you go over to Deneen Coffee, for example, when they're ringing up your order, that's on a Touch Bistro system. Um, by the way, remember when I said you have to outcare your competition? Whenever you're out in the city, especially if you've got customers in the city, try to get as much feedback as possible. So when I go into a shop that's using a Touch Bistro system, I have a conversation with the barista. I have a conversation with the person ringing up the order, the order and I say, what are you using over there? And they, got, they find it really odd that I'm asking them about their point of sale system. Uh, and I say, well, you know, they're like, it's, it's this thing called Touch Bistro. And I go, okay, fantastic. What's your experience being like using it? Are, is your life easier? Are you making more tips, for example? Because this is the unique value proposition that Touch Bistro themselves offer. So you always have to try and model the, your customer's customer to understand whether the things you're doing for your customer are working or not. Um, so next slide. Okay, so this is a startup growth story for, for Touch Bistro. Uh, the bottom line is that over the last year, we've driven 140% year-over-year growth for them that have come from a variety of different channels. That's that, uh, so you can start seeing, for example, sessions, users, and page views. The bottom line, basically, is that our traffic exploded over the last year. And you can start really seeing that their page views went up on that you know, very nice sort of 40 to 45 degree curve, and it's set to do the same, basically, this year. It's following the exact same principles that I outlined on the last slide, which is having to do with putting great content out there. And then we have a framework, basically, in which we, we think about that. So the first step was platform. So when you're thinking about your website, your website is a platform. Uh, your social media accounts are a platform. You have to, make, you have to set them up for success. Uh, that means doing SEO, and it means making sure that you're doing social media optimization. Sometimes it is SMO, right? Being able to do that sets you up for success. It's a foundation, basically, for your platform. The next step is content, okay? Um, everybody says that content is king, okay? It's really, really important. But the problem is this. Most people create content, but they do not promote it. So if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's around, did it really fall? And that's why if you start looking at your own analytics and you put out blog posts and you're wondering why they weren't a hit, when you put a lot of time and effort into them, it's probably because you did not tell the world about your content. How do you tell the world about your content? You, make, you have to have an amplifier and a, and a speakerphone to be able to do that. One of the ways when you're scrappy and you're a startup is just start emailing people who would care about reading that content. And most people don't do that. They just hit the publish button, they forget about it, they move on to the next step afterwards. Um, the second thing that you can really do is start promoting your content on social channels. The biggest myth in social media is that if you hit publish, all of your followers will start seeing your message. Nothing could be further from the truth, okay? You need to start thinking about putting a paid ad spend on every single piece of content that you promote. Here's a way of thinking about that. If you think, I'm not going to give my, my hard-earned money, money to Facebook or to Google, for example, why should I do that when I spent all this money on the content? The way I would encourage you to think about that is, if you are not ready to promote that piece of content, why did you create it in the first place? If it's not worthy of actually paying to get in front of an audience, maybe your content's not good enough and you need to go back to the table to continue making it better. Uh, the third step is audience, which I think you know, folks like Peace Collective have, have figured out completely, right? Being able to know who are you speaking to. And so having things like buyer personas really figured out and to write content for a specific person 
rather than everybody, for example, is a means to being able to be successful. So we did that for Touch Bistro. In this case, they were really going after restaurants as well as the servers specifically at the restaurants. So we didn't just say, make your, your restaurant more efficient. The message was really around how the servers could be more efficient. You know that server, for example, you go in for a birthday party and there's eight people or 12 people sitting at the table. Everybody wants their own individual bill. Have you seen what that server's face looks like, basically? That's the problem we were trying to solve. How could they make more tips while being able to attend a table like that and still keep their tabs on every other table that they were waiting at the same time? So really, the servers were the ambassadors for Touch Bistro. If they were able to start talking to the owners of the restaurants uh, with the content that we were putting in front of them, that's how we did it. We started looking at you know, role-based titles by, by basically promoting it on Facebook, um, I think we've started doing some Instagram ads for them right now as well. So these are the ways we got in front of the audience. Okay, the next thing is measurement, okay? If you don't measure what you, you're basically working on, it won't get managed. So having proper analytics is really key. It's probably a session that could be, I could go for another couple of hours and talking about, but you need to, here's my big tip around that. Set only a few KPIs and don't set those KPIs around vanity metrics. So uh, we've been actually going through this exercise for ourselves. HubSpot's got a new reporting um, add-on where you can create some very fancy dashboards. And those KPIs will be very different for each one of you, right? So for example, in the case of Peace Collective, it's looking at the revenue driven by an ambassador. If that revenue is not over a certain level, you ask that particular ambassador and you go look for a new one. That's gonna be very different from startup to startup to startup. In the case of Touch Bistro, the key thing was really sales growth or lead growth as well as uh, cost per lead. That's a pretty common one for most startups as well as uh, uh, really any growing company. You need to know what your cost of customer acquisition really is. If you don't know that number, go back to the table because otherwise you're flying blind basically. Um, and so that's the story of, of, of Touch Bistro and their startup growth. Um, I'll pause. If you have any questions, you can basically email me at dev at Powered by Search and I'll open it up for uh, questions. Dev, um, thank you for the presentation. I'm uh, curious about how you grew Powered by Search in terms of your personal priorities over that time frame. Um, do you kind of start out and say, I'm going to focus on driving business in and then hire people to be able to, to, to service that business as it grew? Do you kind of do both? I mean, you know, Michael Dell in his book always said that he would try and split his responsibilities every um, specific period of time based on their growth. So how, how does how does HR work across Powered by Search as time went time on? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I'm a firm believer that you, as a founder, you need to hire your first 100 people yourself, or at least be involved in that process. So even though today we've got other people who screen, who basically rate candidates who apply to Powered by Search, um, all hires still go through one of the partners, right? So this week I've been, I don't know, probably on six different interviews uh, for new candidates and, and positions that we're hiring for. Uh, you can certainly have a management team that helps you with that process and what we've done is we built a workflow. So essentially we now know all the steps that basically go into hiring. Uh, in the early days the way that it worked was we're a bit different, I think, than other agencies, including the partners themselves, where we were consultants first, so we did the work, basically. We're not, this is um, our, our first rodeo, essentially. It's all our first businesses, uh, and we learn as we go. But one of the things that separated us from our competition, really, was that we know what we're talking about. So when we have a client ask us a deeply technical question or a complex sort of problem, the founders know how to answer that question. And so you don't necessarily have to then rely back on uh, you know, a staff member at that point to get that answer. So it's very, not very often that we hear at Powered by Search the phrase, let me get back to you. Uh, we usually have that answer fairly quickly on the spot. Uh, and so my, my tip there basically is whatever business you basically go through um, and start, uh, be passionate about it, but also try and make sure that before you get into it, that you are among the top sort of 10% um, in your sort of relative you know, group, if, whether that's in a city or the country or nationally even for that matter. What yep. does your hiring workflow look like in terms of how do you ensure that you get the kinds of people who care about the same things that you care about? Do you have like batteries of tests? Like yeah, it's something that we've stumbled through and I think we've got a pretty good process going now. Uh, so the first step really is 
uh, make sure you write a really great job description. And it's important to write the job description that your people will actually be doing. Most frequently what I see is uh, employers look at other people advertising a job, they lift the copy, and they basically create a, a Franken page basically of job descriptions. The trouble with big companies is that the recruiters write these job descriptions and they usually are looking for overqualification over basically. So whereas something might be, you know, a position might need two years of experience, they say you gotta have five or seven, right? Or they'll, they'll give you an example of something you'd never really do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first step was make sure that the job description accurately reflects what that person would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The second thing was make that job description compelling. So we actually put some word into wordsmithing the, the job descriptions so that they sound compelling and make people want to apply. Um, the third thing that we do is we don't accept resumes. So um, we, we figured that a resume is just not a very good way of being able to judge a person's um, competencies or fit. So we look at a couple of other ways of being able to do that. One way is a cover letter, obviously, but the second way is uh, doing questionnaires. So uh, most of our positions have a questionnaire right in the beginning. We go through a phone screen process. The phone screen is really for um, just a, a couple of hard questions around whether there's fit or not. Then there's an in-person interview, which is situational. So we actually make candidates play through a week on the job and what they feel their understanding of the job description really is. Then we do a challenge, and this is probably the, the one thing that sets us apart where um, if you work, uh, if you're hiring developers, coding challenges are pretty table stakes for most companies hiring developers. We basically made it so that everybody here has gone through a challenge. So everybody who works here has gone through a challenge. One of the things in the challenge basically is that uh, we look for storytelling ability no matter what your role basically is. So the thing that we ask our candidates to do is to create a video, basically a screencasting video, like on Snagit or something like that, where they're basically composing their, their thoughts together and telling a story in a, in a span of 10 minutes, uploading it to YouTube. It does a couple of things, even for the most basic of roles. It just proves to us that, that person's capable of using a web browser, okay? Uh, and, and being able to be resourceful and knowing how to Google things even if they don't necessarily, they, they, maybe they've never recorded a video to begin with, right? But we, we just like to see how people think and uh, compose your thoughts basically together. So hopefully that gives you some perspective into the hiring process. When it comes to content, do you ever outsource it or buy it? Uh, no, we create all our own content ourselves. However, for clients, we've got a crowdsourced team of writers that is managed with all editorial strategy, all of that basically in-house. So the question from Jordan is basically, when you have no clients, how do you put value first? because value is typically realized after you deliver a service. So how do you make that happen uh, up front? Uh, you publish, basically, at that point of time. So you pretend you've got a client. You basically assume the sale. And so if there's a company that you really want to work with, you tear down what you would be doing differently for them. You write a nice blog post on it. You send it to them and say, hey, look at this. This should be something that you want to read. Then you send it to all their, comp their competitors, basically, as well. And one of them will bite. If you were, um uh, at the beginning, if you were doing a blog post, where would you put the blog post out and how would you promote it? Uh, in the beginning, I would put it out on my own, on, the, on our site basically. But afterwards, once we started uh, promoting it, which would be literally just emailing every single webmaster for a different blog in our industry, letting them know about it with the hopes that they would either tweet about it, link to it, share it on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, afterwards, we started doing guest blogging, so being able to go out and publish on their content or on their platform, rather, um, and that netted us a lot, a lot more new traffic, basically. So that that will work for you in, in pretty much any industry. What do you think of something like LinkedIn Pulse? Uh, LinkedIn Pulse is actually really powerful. You know, I, I've noticed that on a per engagement basis, I'd rather publish on LinkedIn Pulse than on Medium because you know the, the people who are actually engaging with, with that content. And it has, you know, LinkedIn Pulse is kind of the, the wild, wild west right now. It's where SlideShare used to be many years ago, and it's relatively easy to get on the front page of LinkedIn Pulse. LinkedIn is um, pretty crude in its terms of its, its algorithms for judging good content. Um, so, you know, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways of being able to get more visibility there. So come talk to me some more afterwards, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. Uh, I think there was a question here, Andy? Yeah, you mentioned Tony Robbins once or twice. Uh, any other influencers that you draw from? Yeah, my, probably my biggest in my early days was Zig Ziglar. 
Uh, it's where I learned all my, my sales skills. Um, and also just having a growth mindset around goal setting and being able to be honest with myself around me getting, getting things done. A um, couple of other ones that are, are useful as well. Uh, Grant Cardone, uh, again, I, I usually learn a lot from sales and motivational leaders like that. Um, interesting enough, uh, when you get to a latter stage startup, basically, you're not just looking for those sort of aggressive teachers around growth and motivational mindset, but I've been reading a lot more about Buddhism, for example, recently, and being able to just think about thinking. So, you know, it's known as metacogitation, but just being able to think about the stuff you're thinking about. And that can really ground you and be, uh, make you mindful and more present about what, how, you, how you conduct yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you tell us just a little bit about um, probably person, not, not influencers in general, but advisors for you as a founder, as a business owner then? You know, do you keep a, um, a, a directorship or a, an advisory team to kind of help you with your own personal decisions and, and your knowledge? And, you know, how do you manage that? How do you choose who your advisors are? And how do you... Have you ever had a point where you kind of have to move on and find other advisors as you grow your business? Yeah, I think that my advisors um, have always been folks who write amazing books, for example, or publish online. Uh, the folks that I reach out to for hard uh, personal decisions are usually, I have two kinds of friends, okay? The, the, the ones that are entrepreneurs themselves and have some of the same, same issues, basically, in terms of, uh, or challenges in scaling. And then I have friends who have nothing to do with entrepreneurship. These are people that I've known 10 years ago when uh, I was nobody, basically. And they've been along with me for the same ride that, uh, you know, over the last 10 years in our lives have changed and grown and in many different ways. And we might be completely different people, but those are the people that keep me grounded. Um, and they keep me grounded because they haven't cared about any of the success, right? To them, I'm just the same old guy, basically, I was 10 years ago. Uh, and it's important to, to not, you know, forget where you came from, basically. So I have those two sets that give me very different sets of advice, and I find equal amount of value in, in, in both of those, uh, those audiences or both of those types of friends. Okay, yep. so blogging. I see people blogging all the time. How, would it be beneficial for me to blog? And how do I learn about doing it? The first question I would ask you is what is your goal, right? So um, if your goal, for example, is to attract more clients, right, uh, then you might want to blog at that point in time. But so, I mean, maybe you could tell me what is your goal? Okay, so I'm, I'm definitely trying to grow the wedding packages and, we, and, and hair for wedding, hair, makeup, photography, all of that. Yeah. Uh, so what I would say is that any kind of content that you create to make a bride feel on top of the world on that wedding day is going to help you um, score you know, uh, quite a large client base. Um, the folks that I would encourage you to learn from would be my friends at Luxie Hair. Uh, Luxie Hair is run by... They, oh, fantastic. Okay, so you can learn a lot about appealing to women's emotions through them basically because yeah. they so for those of you who don't know Luxy Hair is uh, in the business of uh, they're in the hair extension business basically but I think that their their purpose is larger than that they they want people to feel on top of the world and that's really what they do they they create some amazing content on YouTube primarily helping women feel more beautiful basically um, and it's through huge hair tutorials and often it doesn't have anything to do with, with selling their own hair extensions so my friends Alex and Mimi um, Icon, they run it, and I would encourage you to check out their channel because they really are uh, the definition of givers in terms of their, that content because it's completely free. Uh, it's got no call to actions or gotchas or, you know, they don't want an email opt-in, for example, and uh, they've grown that into a multi-million dollar business just by being able to be helpful. Yeah, thank you guys.